Well, we are, we are getting back into the sermon series that we were in. And, and, and my question for you as we start off today is, how many of you would consider yourselves to be communications experts? You know, you're that sort of person who always speaks clearly. People understand exactly what you mean. There's never any confusion, never any conflict because of something you said, and nobody ever has hurt feelings. You, you are a communication master. Where's the hands? I mean, this is a, a large crowd. There's got to be at least one, right? No? Well, my hand is not up. I'm just an example. I'm not <laughs> perfect either, right? Because we're not experts, are we? We make mistakes. We're not perfect. We say things in anger. We talk when we should be listening. We speak without thinking. And we have a biblical example of that in Peter, right? So that's been going on for a while. And that's exactly why we are going to be talking about this today. We're in the middle of a sermon series, and I welcome you kind of to my living room here. We've got the lights, and Tanya has some fresh flowers, or somebody does, and they were kind of decorated to make it a comfortable space here. And we're in this sermon series that's been ongoing for a while called Modern Family and Vintage Values. And we've been on this two-week hiatus for the missions conference, but we're back at it today. And if you were expecting a, a flowery sermon for Mother's Day, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I'm not going to give you a Mother's Day sermon, but you still have to be able to communicate with your mother, so it's kind of a Mother's Day sermon. Does that count? Do I get credit? But I think it will be good. I believe it will be good. I've worked hard on this sermon, and as I was going through it again last night, I was, I, I was loving it, so hopefully you'll like it too. But I think this subject is so incredibly important. And, and as a plus, um, like I said, you do have to communicate with your mom, so take notes, Okay. Let's start from the very beginning with honesty. Communicating is super complex, right? We, we all do it, but as we admitted just a moment ago, most of us, uh, we don't do it all that well. It, it is super complex. And the fact is that the part of the reason it's so complex is much of what we say, we, we don't actually say. Much of what we communicate is nonverbal. We know this, we hear about this, but, but our nonverbal is such an important component of what we say. Our, our body language, our nonverbal cues. <laughs> Got a teenager? They're full of nonverbal cues, right? We can say all kinds of things without saying much at all. Now, researchers have found that in strong and healthy families, there are patterns of good communication. The exact opposite is true in weak and failing families. Weak and failing families, on average, are much poorer at communicating with one another. So healthy families communicate better. Clear communication is necessary for healthy relationships in our families, in our marriages, in our church, in our friendships, in our workplaces, and in our schools. Wherever we go, we need to learn healthy ways to communicate. And as we continue in the sermon series, I believe that God wants to communicate to us His truth and the reality of communication and the impact that it has on each and every one of us and on every one of our relationships, in fact. Thankfully... Thankfully, we have a God who continues to speak wisdom through His Word, our Bible. And I hope that you'll take from this today, from this message that I'm sharing with you, the ability to at least think about communicating better, even if you don't communicate better right away. We're going to be in the book of Proverbs primarily. I'm going to rattle off a bunch of Proverbs today. The nature of Proverbs is that they are kind of one-liners for the most part, and so... uh, You're welcome to open Proverbs 15 as the bulk of them, but there's another one in Proverbs 25 and some other places, so you may find it hard to follow along. But if you'd like to follow along, there are Bibles in your pews. U version is a good Bible version if you'd like to look those on. And and as we continue through this, um, when we, we look at communications, we need to realize it isn't always exactly what we say, as I was mentioning, but it's how we say it, right? For example, how many of you guys have ever been in this situation where your wife says to you, how does this dress look on me? 
What's the right answer to that, guys? Trick question. There is no right answer. Just tell her that you love her, tell her that she is beautiful, and tell her that you will be downstairs where it is much safer. (laughs) Right? But we know, as we communicate, there there are pitfalls and landmines and things all over the place, and in situations that sometimes we're almost better just to avoid. Now, as we, as we look at communications and as we look at the Proverbs, there's, there's so much that the Bible has to say about it. When it comes to communicating, there are two primary ways in which we as humans communicate. If you're following along in your notes there, the first one of them is simply this. The first way that we communicate is called instrumental communication. This kind of communication is an exchange. It's an exchange of factual information to fulfill a common function. Okay? Things like, when do I need to pick up the kids from football? Or, what time are you going to be home? What do I need to pick up when I go to the store? This type of communication is simple, yet it's important. Because if you show up and you don't have all the kids you were supposed to pick up, you're in trouble, right? If you show up an hour after the roast was done, uh uh-oh. If you go to the store and you come back home and you get ready to cook for the dinner guests that are going to be there in a half hour and you forgot to pick up the stuff that you were supposed to pick up when you went, good luck, right? So this is an important component of our communicating. And when we make those mistakes, that kind of puts us into the second category of communication. And that second category is called effective, with an A, effective. Not effective, we need to be effective as well, but affective communication. Effective is the way that people share their emotions with one another. So in those settings, we might ask something like, how do you feel about that decision, right? We, we want to get to that underlying emotional level. We don't just ask, what did you do? But we ask, how do you feel from it? Clear communication starts with how we say things. The book of Proverbs, as I mentioned, talks an awful lot about how we use our words. It says over and over and over again that we can be one of two things. We can either be wise or we can be what? Foolish with our words. And so Proverbs 15.1 says, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh answer stirs up anger. In other words, a, a gentle response in a situation calms the anger And a hard word provokes it. Sometimes, if you're like me at least, sometimes we answer with a hammer where a feather would have done, right? And then we live to regret that response. Sometimes we could respond lightly instead of strongly. But a gentle answer doesn't have to be weak necessarily. Proverbs 25.15 says, A soft tongue is powerful enough to break bones. We can still give a strong answer in a gentle answer. And as we look at the how in the ways in which we use our words, I want to look specifically at Proverbs 12.18 as our key verse for today. And in Proverbs 12.18, it says this. It says that reckless words pierce like a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In other words, Do we think about our words before we actually say them? Or do we just let venom spew out and spill forth from us like like a, a deadly snake? Or do we see our words even before we utter them as ways that maybe we could use to bring healing in a situation? Do we... Do we envision our words as an opportunity for reconciliation or maybe comfort or encouragement or truth or love or grace? You see, our words have the power to either heal or to kill. As Proverbs 15.4 says, the tongue that brings healing is a tree of life. We've all experienced those situations where words bring healing rather than destruction. And each and every one of us have the ability to choose to respond in most situations, in ways that are healing rather than killing. 
Suppose there was a, a manager of a grocery store, and he decides to take inventory of the whole store. And buried at the bottom of his meat section, he finds a package of overripe hamburger. Somehow, this hamburger has been sitting there for three weeks, rotting meat. What should he do with that meat? Well, of course, pick it up, get rid of it, throw it away, right? He should get rid of it immediately. And make sure he never neglects the inventory ever again, right? Because he has this beautiful store stocked with wonderful produce, gorgeous looking displays. But if you walk in and you smell that, you ever smelt that before? I've smelt that before. Ho, 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 ho. The stench of rotting meat. You walked into a grocery store that smelled like that, you'd do a 180 and walk your way back out. Because it smells like death. Now it's the same when it comes to our communication. Less than 1% of our word inventory can ruin and affect all of the rest of the things that we say. You might be careful and watch what you say for the 99%, but that 1% can cancel it all out. Most of us do not realize the effect of what we say, even unintentionally sometimes. The how in what we communicate is so important. We have to be willing to be honest and look at ourselves about how we communicate and about what we say and, and the real strengths and weaknesses we have. So how are you doing? How are you at using your words? It matters. It does. It impacts your Christian witness to the world. How we say things is so incredibly important. But so is what we say. The what is the substance, right? The substance that we need to communicate clearly and directly. Jesus talked frequently about the substance. For instance, he said in Matthew 5, 37, he says, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from the evil one. Now imagine if our politicians were to live by this, right? Our lives would be so much simpler, the world would be so much better. But oftentimes, and it's easy to take pot shots at politicians, but oftentimes we're no better than they are, if we're honest about it. The problem is, we want to keep our options open, don't we? We don't want to hurt somebody else's feelings. We don't want to tell somebody no. We like to avoid those situations, most of us. So when it comes to the what of communications, Colossians 3.8 also warns us to be careful about the substance. Colossians 3.8 says, But now you must put them all away. Put away anger. Put away wrath. Put away malice. Put away slander and obscene talk from your mouth. Paul is saying that we need to get rid of this kind of language. Get rid of those words. They are destructive to us and to others. And they, they not only hurt us, but they hurt others and they hurt our Christian witness. Yes, we do get angry at times. But our words should never be used to attack the character of anyone else. As Christians, our standard has to be higher. We're not going to be perfect at this. I'm not perfect at this. But we have to work at this, being intentional. Proverbs also says that our, our substance, the things we communicate, should be truth. So Proverbs 25.18 says that a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a war club or a sword or a sharp arrow. All three of those are weapons for death, right? Throughout the book of Proverbs, we are called to be wise and called to be people of honesty and integrity. And when we lie, when we slander, when we talk behind others' back, when we speak falsely about those around us, we kill our witness to the world as Christ followers. Our words are to be loving and redeeming and truthful, without malice and without falsehood. As we're talking about communications, another thing that we have to be careful with, another thing we have to keep in check is how much 
we say. Now, some of us, of course, just talk, 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 talk. That's not really what I'm talking about. I'll explain. We do have to keep in check how much we say. And it's not just what we say, but how we say it that we need to be mindful of, but additionally, how much we say. And for some of us, this is a problem. When it comes to communications, we need to communicate frequently if we want to communicate clearly. For most of us, me included, we need to hear things more than one time in order for it to register and set in, right? If you tell me something and you don't repeat it, there's a low likelihood that I'm going to remember it. When it comes to communication, we need to communicate it frequently if we want to communicate it clearly. So if you come back next week, I'll be preaching this exact same sermon just to make sure <laughs> that you heard it. I'm kidding, of course. But we know this is true. We need to hear it over and over again. And I think this is particularly a challenge in this day and age. I do. I think there's, there's more noise in our lives now than ever before. Our lives are filled with so much noise. TVs everywhere. Music on every electrical device. I can't go to the gas station and pump gas without a TV. Seriously. There's TVs on the gas pumps. Advertisements, commercials, informational commercials, infomercials, right? Pop-ups on your web browser. We get, we get junk mail. We get spam in our email. We get telemarketers calling us. Signs on the side of the road. Ads in the bathroom. Seriously? Noise everywhere. And it begins to crowd out the things that we need to hear again and again and again. And if we're not careful, it crowds out the things that we should be listening to. We are bombarded each and every day by thousands of different messages competing for our time. There is a, a magnitude of information in the world today that the world has never seen before. And so it can be very hard to filter and find what is important. All of this just to say that we need to say what is important and then repeat what is important to us frequently. Tell your family that you love them. Tell them what is important to you. Share your values. Communicate the why behind what you believe is true and right. And then do it again. And then do it again. And again and again and again. And repeat again. Tell people you love them over and over. Tell people what you value over and over. Tell people what you know to be true over and over. I used to train people how to wait tables. I worked for Red Lobster for 10 years of my adult life. And then one of the primary responsibilities had was that I was titled the server trainer. And I would train people all throughout the Twin Cities. I trained regular servers. I trained all of the managers. I trained everybody how to wait tables. And one of the very most important things, and it may not sound important to you, but it, it is indeed important when you're waiting tables, is to have a good table approach. And so when I would be training these people, they would be with me for maybe 10 or 12 hours as my shadow. I would, every single time I would approach a table with them as my shadow, I would make absolutely sure that I would repeat the exact same table approach. Not because I couldn't use a different table approach. I actually usually did when I wasn't with a trainee. But they had to learn a system. And the way they were going to learn it was through repetition. So I would approach the table every time. Hi, my name is Chris. Welcome to Red Lobster. Blah, 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 blah. Every single time. So that 40 or 50 times during that week or two weeks that they were following me, they would hear me do it so that when they were going to be doing it as I would watch them, they would have it kind of ingrained into them, hammered into them, pounded into them. Because you would be surprised how many people, the first time they walk up to a table and they go, oh, and they forget everything they're supposed to say. Right? I'd seen that way too many times over the years. And so I just started repeating and repeating and repeating. And when we hit those moments, 
all of a sudden that training kicks in. So instead of having a deer in the headlights, you might have somebody freeze for a moment, but then they'll go, oh, hi, my name is Katie. Welcome to Red Lobster, blah, 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 blah. Right? We learn things by repetition. That is incredibly important. Are you hearing me? So what is it that you repeat in your communication to the people around you? Is the only thing people around you hear repeated complaints and criticisms? Ow, kind of hit close to home. Right? We might need to self-reflect a little bit on this about what it is that we repeatedly communicate. Think of how often the Bible repeats itself. And I'm not talking just Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But thematically, how often does the Bible challenge us to trust God? Is it just once? To say, trust God and then move on? No. Trust God, trust God, trust God, trust God, trust God, trust God. Right? How often... How often does the Bible tell us that we are loved by God? Again and again and again. How often does the Bible talk about money? A fair bit. Right? It repeats itself again and again because we need to hear it more than once and sometimes many times before we actually really will hear it. So what do you repeat to those around you? Are you sharing love? Are you sharing your values? Are you sharing encouragement? Communication is more than just talking. Communication is also listening as well, and how we listen matters. My guess is that every one of us could grow in this area, right? This isn't a new problem. The problem is simply to listen. The very first sermon I was ever assigned back in seminary was on this verse, James 1.19. There it says, Be quick to listen, be slow to speak, and be slow to anger. Think of yourself as working at a fast food restaurant. I've done that too. I have five years in fast food on top of my ten years at Red Lobster. Hi, welcome to Wendy's. May I take your order? For five years I said that. When you're working at the drive-thru, you got that headset on, what is truly your job? I mean, first, you've got to greet them. But then after that, what is your job? Just to listen. What would you like? Sometimes you stand there waiting for an awfully long time as they figure it out, but you listen. Your job is to listen to that order and get it correctly. And then as the attendant, as the, as the employee, your job isn't to tell the customer what they want. No, your job is simply to listen. And so we don't say to them, no, 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 you really don't want that triple cheeseburger. <laughs> that wouldn't go over so well. The bikini season's coming, and that's not going to be good. No, we take their order. We listen. We're not speaking, we listen. We might clarify a thing or two. But we listen. And as a, a wise person once said, God gave you two ears and one mouth, use them proportionately. You can write that down. That's wisdom. Not a proverb, but that's wisdom. Listening is more, though, than just not talking, right? True hearing is not just hearing the words that are spoken, but it's hearing the feelings that underlie the spoken words. When we hear those feelings, it is then that people know we are truly listening. I'll readily admit, I'm terrible at this. I'm trying to get better. I listen, but often I listen with a solution to your problem. And the problem with listening with a solution to your problem is I quickly quit listening. I might look like I'm listening, but I'm thinking about how to fix whatever it is you're sharing with me. I'm a problem solver. I want to fix things and then I want to move on. That's my strength. That's my weakness. And I'm not always patient. Have you ever been listening to somebody and started thinking about your response and then all of a sudden realized 
I have no idea what they've said for like the last two minutes. And you're lost in a conversation that you're supposed to be part of. That never happens to me. Never. Honestly, if there was a recovery group, I'd be at every meeting for that. We have to put ourselves aside momentarily. We have to put ourselves to the side and be present and be good listeners. Stop. Be in the moment. Hear the person. Observe the person. Connect with them. And truly listen. By doing this, we can avoid the problems that we find in Proverbs 15.2, where it says, The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. If we speak fully before we listen, we're likely to put out folly, wasting our breath, saying something stupid and hurtful or unhelpful. Now let me wrap all this up and bring this all back together to one key point as to why communicating matters so much. We are modern families, but we want to have vintage values. And as Christians, we are tasked with the weighty responsibility of sharing our faith, of sharing our beliefs, of sharing our Jesus with the rest of the world. You and me, that's our job. There's nobody else who can do it for us. So how we communicate absolutely matters. The words we use, the way we use them, how frequently we communicate, what is important to us, all of that, as well as how we listen, can have a positive or a negative impact on our ability to share Jesus with others around us. The Bible has an awful lot to say about how we should be communicating. And that is because God thinks it is important. And God knows He needs to remind us again and again because we're probably pretty bad at this. We're probably going to need a lot of those reminders. So my challenge to you this week, work on your communication. Read through the book of Proverbs. Find some of the things in there that it speaks about how we should communicate with one another. Why? Because people are dying spiritually, emotionally, and physically. And they are looking and wanting to hear some kind of hope from some kind of church. But are we telling them that we will listen? Are we telling them what is important? Are we willing to tell them what is true? Are we modeling all of this in our lives? For a lot of the people in this world, they will never open a Bible on their own to read it. But they can see Jesus through you and through me. Are you showing them it through your lives? Are they seeing Christ in you as you communicate? What are people hearing? And are, they, are you truly listening? That is the questions for today. Let's pray.